Hello, and welcome back to Over the Top, an overthrow produced podcast where we give you an inside look to conversations that I get to have all the time with players and coaches. And we're just going to talk until things aren't interesting anymore or until we have to go. <laughs> so um, if you are, if you want to support this podcast, you can do so by checking out the links in the description below. Um, visiting our store, we have coaching online via Patreon. If you want to support Holland Hanley, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let her tell you the best way to do that right now. Yeah, Team Discraft site. Um, I've got a whole bunch of new discs up there. We've got Vultures, Buzz SS, Zones, all kinds of stuff. Um, and I get a little bit of that money every time you buy something. So go buy something. Go buy her stuff. If you find value in this podcast, you want to support her. That's the best way you can do it. And we know you're going to buy discs. So consider hers. Cool. Okay. Intro done. Um, awesome. So I've got just a couple things that I've got questions on. I kind of want to take people through your entire season from off season or well, your entire year from off season all the way through all tournament right. and then get really deep into tournament prep. Um, cool. Yeah. And then, of course, any little rabbit trails we go down are very welcomed. For the off season, I was uh, on a ranch in Oklahoma, so very isolated. Nobody there to really bug me, so it's really good environment to just kind of like dig in and kind of hammer away at some things. Um, and as you know, I had some form stuff I wanted to work on, so that first couple of months uh, was really heavily focused on uh, fixing some things with my backhand. It was a lot of no disc drills, a lot of throwing into a net um, for just like hours uh and filming everything um and so i kind of you know on top of that i was having to learn a new bag and knowing that i was going to need to at some point kind of cut things off and start preparing shots and kind of getting out of that form change mode and more into competitive mode so i kind of set myself a cut off of about mid-january uh to be done working on form stuff so yeah from about early november till about mid-january i was really just working on like basically what my wrist was doing um it's causing me some problems with with nose angle and i would say i mostly fixed it i don't think i got a hundred percent what i you know i didn't get to a hundred percent what i wanted i'd say maybe i got about 65 70 percent um which was enough to see a pretty big improvement in throwing um and then on top of that obviously uh weight training um and then, yeah, learning the new bag. And so about mid-January kind of was like, all right, we're done looking at form stuff. We're going to go just like try to shape shots and, you know, figure out like how do I need to run up with this slight form change? Like how do these different discs fly? And just kind of like getting out there with a stack of each mold in my bag and just learning the stabilities, learning the shot shaping capabilities um, and trying to get ready for uh, for the seasons to start. Yeah, so we've got um, this topic for you nerdy listeners is called periodization it's like how you structure different periods within the season so how long was your off season when did it start and when did it end yeah so my last tournament was the first weekend of november um and i, I pretty much dove right in uh right away i didn't really take uh too long of a break just because i knew i had a lot that i wanted to accomplish didn't feel particularly burned out um, so yeah, probably like November 7th ish up until like, let's see, when did I leave for all stars? I left for all stars would have been mid February, like third week of February. So it's that November, December, January. So like three and a half months or so. Yeah. So you, so the things that you had to accomplish, you had a couple form pieces that you need to accomplish during your off season, and then you had to learn a new bag and then you had to get your shots course ready. So yep. you gave yourself two months basically for form stuff. And you said after this two months, January comes on learning new discs and how to aim them. Yeah, pretty much. And I mean, building the new bag, it's not as like ridiculous as a lot of people make it sound. Um, obviously, Discraft sent me just a ton of everything. Um, and then, of course, we had the whole 
team kind of like week but we all got together in florida and so you know the team members kind of added some stuff to the bag but really just like built you know tried some stuff like one day in a field you go out you throw everything they send you a whole bunch of times you get an idea for how stable they are and you kind of put a bag together um and then you know i'd go play rounds i'd go do field work and kind of see like okay what are some stuff that's overlapping with some stuff that i actually don't really like and then trying maybe some new variants and and then getting to actually talk to the people who've been throwing these molds for a while and kind of getting their input you know they had some suggestions on some tweaks to make and so i probably iterated on the bag like three or four times before vegas um and since then i've maybe made a couple little tweaks um but it's really not that bad especially when you have a lineup as robust as discrafts and they're willing to send you like multiple of everything so you could just try stuff um so the that and the shot learning were kind of concurrent um so if i was like you know oh i really like vultures so send me a big stack of vultures i'm in the field working with the stack of vultures like not only am i learning the shot shaping but i'm kind of learning like okay this one that's like four grams lighter beats in a little faster and this domier one's a little more stable this plastic's a little more stable and so i can kind of figure out like actually i want three of them in the bag and then it's these three because i've been throwing them in the field a whole bunch so i know one how to use the mold but two like what are the variations between the individual discs that i have and then you know you do that on every speed basically uh, and it all kind of comes together yeah was there anything so when you go between molds of different companies sometimes there's that slot like everybody knows okay i want my overstable fairway driver my firebird my raptor my you know whatever it is was there a slot that you couldn't quite find a disc to fill from your old sponsor that you were like, I kind of have to learn to throw this shot shape differently? Yeah, definitely. I could give a, a few examples. So, like, probably the biggest one is when I first started throwing a zone, um, it was actually pretty terrible. Um, I couldn't get... I was trying to throw it just like a harp or just like a justice, which is what I threw before. Um, and, like, the hit point's a little bit different. All right, so the spot where my elbow stops and my wrist comes forward, it's not the same as either of those two discs. And so it wasn't like I couldn't get super clean, consistent releases at first. Um, so that was just like taking stacks of zones and trying to figure out like, okay, where's this hit point? And when I find the hit point, just drilling that and drilling that until it becomes supernatural. And um, I mean, I bag three zones now and it's probably like one of my most important discs in the bag. Um Another example, like I used to throw that, I had this beat in first run trust uh, that I threw a ton last year. It was my go to mid range. I hardly threw any other mid ranges because for me it just was easy to get it dead straight. But it kind of sits perfectly like in between a buzz and a buzz SS. Um, and so, kind of like knowing going into it, it's like I'm not going to find a one to one replacement for every slot in my bag. Um, but kind of being like, okay, well, you know, I can learn to put like maybe a little bit of Annie on this buzz or learn to put like Heiser flip a little bit more consistently so that I can make these kind of one of these two discs work for situations when I would have thrown the trust last year. Um, and then, I mean, now more than halfway through the season, it doesn't feel any different. They feel completely natural to me. Um, and then for like Raptors, so felons beat in pretty quick especially depending on the run of felon so if i wanted a flippy felon it was easy to get one um raptors not so much they don't quite beat in as quickly and so that was actually our team manager bob uh, when i told him i needed a flippy raptor because i didn't really want to change molds um i didn't like any of the more understable molds because the hit point was too different from my raptors um and my preference when throwing forehands is to kind of have one hit point and then just throw a faster or slower version of the same stability. So zone, raptor, force, they're all pretty overstable. Um, but I like having a beat-in variant of each one. And so he actually pulled a disc from his own bag that was just a flippy raptor. And that's been kind of my straight forehand disc. So kind of three different approaches there, um, like learning how to throw a different mold. And then, like, finding something on either side of what I had and then just finding, like, a flippy version of something, um, getting some help from teammates and whatnot. Yeah, you got to talk to Gossage. Just take all his extras. Oh, yeah, we, we talked about that. He's complaining about how he's like, oh, I beat in these nukes so quick. I'm like, you want to hand those to me, please? 
It's like, I don't, I don't need a out of the box nuke. I need like a Goss is just throwing it for a month nuke. You know, that's going to be a bomber for me. <laughs> right. Um, so back uh, within kind of this periodization talk. So the weightlifting you mentioned, the field work you mentioned, um, and the shot selection. So when during your first two months, when you're when you're going at it, tell me about um, the lifting schedule inside of that kind of training month. And did the list where in the off season did the lifting schedule fit in? How long and like, when did it stop and did you ramp it up or did you ramp it down? Yeah. So I think in this next off season, I'm going to approach the lifting side of things a little bit differently. Um, just cause I had so much time that I was dedicating to form work. I mean, I was spending probably six to eight hours a day just on form stuff. Um, and so the gym took a little bit of a back burner. Like I was still in the gym four to five times a week. Um, focusing mostly on mobility um so like you know being able to do things through a full range of motion so basically like strength training through a really full range of motion rather than just strictly trying to get stronger through say like a squat or a, you know what i would do for power lifting um because being really strong through a full range of motion is what's going to protect you from injury um like you you train that way so that you can handle the demands that the sport puts on you um, and so I pretty much trained the same way throughout the, the entire off season. I think I'm going to periodize it a little bit more this off season, um, make a little bit more of an effort at least early on to maybe put on some muscle and then, um, kind of ramp that down into more of like explosive training towards the end of the off season, something similar to what I would have done for, uh, another sport that's, that requires kind of explosive power, but it was just kind of, uh, like a time and, and energy commitment kind of thing. I was really hyper focused on on form stuff and a little less so on gym stuff. Yeah, even so, you got you got in the gym enough. Are you taking the like the workouts from volleyball? Or are you looking at another sport? Where are these uh, workout ideas coming from? Yeah, so it's kind of a, a combination of things. Um, I looked a little bit at like, you know, what do like tennis players do? What do golf players do? What are baseball players do like to protect their shoulders and their arms and such? Um, I borrowed actually pretty heavily from this group called Athletic Truth Group. So it's this guy who's like his whole thing is um, basically like getting your knees healthy if you have knee problems. And like that's it, it's pretty well based in kind of the same thing I was saying of like protect, you know, training all the muscles around your joints through full ranges of motion to protect them from demands of sport. Um, and so there, I kind of have whittled it down since then to a few like key movements that really help keep my knees and my elbow healthy. Um, Cause with the amount of power side arms I'm throwing, like uh, I notice like a pretty stark difference um, when I'm consistent with, training certain muscles uh, versus what I'm not. And then same thing with the knees. Those are kind of the two things that get me beat up the most for me. Um, and so I think going forward this year, because I know what those movements are, like kind of the bare minimum to keep myself healthy, I can kind of use that as my base and then, you know, push to, to other goals from there. Um, so to give people an idea, I, I think I kind of have an idea of the training you're doing just because it's very similar to tennis training for high performance players but this is band work like resistance bands medicine balls lunges um that thing where you start on the ground with a kettlebell and then you like work your way up um i don't remember what that's called <laughs> yeah it's a a lot of a lot of it too is just like what i have um so i think we didn't set up like our full home gym because we didn't really have space for it um, so I did have like a barbell and I had some dumbbells. I had a little bit of resistance band stuff as well. So I mostly was working with those things. Um, and then, you know, a couple of days a week, you have to drive half an hour to go to Planet Fitness where I was. Um, so, you know, I wasn't going there every day, but I would go there usually at least two to three days a week. And then the other workouts would be done at home. Um, but yeah, a lot of lunges, um, a lot of hip hinges, that sort of thing. You know, a lot of like, uh, for shoulder, you know, during external rotations, doing a lot of curls and tricep press downs just to keep the elbow um, feeling really good. 
um, not a ton of like direct app work or anything like that. And then I think this year I would like to add a little bit more of like plyometric stuff, maybe some med ball throws, some things that are a little bit more explosive and add that in toward the end of season or toward the end of the off season. Excuse me. Yeah. Tennis players spend a lot. I've seen a lot of um, like high level tennis players go and spend a lot of time on beaches because just like the footwork pieces and stuff done on a beach, just absolutely one destroy your legs Two, they help all those little stabilizer muscles around your joints because you have that kind yeah. of uneven and that's where people can really yeah we hurt. used to do that in volleyball yeah so yeah i don't really see too much reason to, to do that for disc golf i also like i don't do a whole lot of cardio um because like we're just hiking and like while it is physically taxing it is just hiking it's not like um jumping and changing directions quickly and, and sprinting or anything like that um actually to prepare for kind of this next swing of tour, I did add a little bit of cardio just to like get accustomed to the little bit higher heart rates and getting the heart rate back down um, before having to do like putt. Um, I'm envisioning hole two at Deglo having to walk up that big hill and like not wanting to be winded by the time I get up there. Um, but I don't really think like a lot of cardio is that necessary, especially when I'm doing, you know, six plus hours of field work every day. Right. Yeah, do you think, now this is totally loaded, sorry about that, but uh, do you think most <laughs> people on tour are where they need to be fitness-wise, or do you think the hiking up and down, like, people actually struggle with that, or if they do, like, they really shouldn't? Yeah, I think people on tour could definitely benefit from strength training. I think too few people do it, and I think of the people that do it, it's not the best. Um, and I say, I don't know what everyone is doing all of the time. I'm just kind of projecting based off of what I see. Um, you know, I do see players at planet fitness or whatever, getting, you know, working out and watching some of the stuff they do. And I'm like, yeah, it's not bad, but it could be better. Um, I think doing something is like exponentially better than doing nothing. And I think there are too many people who are kind of doing nothing. And then a lot of those people will complain about like, oh, my elbow, my shoulder, my back, you know, stuff's hurting. And it's like, you're not really taking care of yourself. So, of course, it's hurting. Yeah. Do you work or anything during the off season? Do you have uh, ways that you make income or are are you kind of set question. up um, with your sponsorships? What What's the deal? Yeah. Uh, this off season, I didn't really have to do anything. Um, you know, my sponsored deal... It, one, I don't really have expenses in the off season because I can just park the trailer at the ranch. We installed hookups, we installed a septic system. So like we just park there like it's any campground. Um, so there's not like I'm having to pay rent or anything. So my expenses are extremely low. Um, and then, yeah, Discraft pays me, you know, monthly. I have a monthly guarantee that like pretty easily covers everything, especially if I'm not traveling. So yeah, didn't have to work. Um, the previous off season... You know, I kind of supplemented with some, like, lessons and stuff here and there. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't really have to do anything. <laughs> yeah, with your lessons in the off offseason, um, those are local in-person lessons, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and obviously if I'm living in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, there's not really anyone to teach locally unless I want to, like, drive an hour to Norman or something, which I didn't really want to do. Um, I kind of prioritized my own... Uh, progress over teaching anyone else <laughs> for sure probably a good weekend on the pro tour is worth more than a, a handful of lessons in terms of differences in, in placement yeah so, definitely but are you planning on taking definitely. students next off season and do you know where you're going to be next off season r roundabouts i mean if i had to guess right now we'll probably be back in the same middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. So probably not going to be able to do a ton of in-person lessons. Um, hard to really say. I haven't thought that far ahead yet. <laughs> yeah. Is there um, a legit, a lot of logistical stuff that you have to do in the off season? Like when you're scheduling your tour and all that, yeah. is there just what, what's the stuff that I just don't even as a plebeian disc golfer think about? <laughs> I think it's a little bit different for everybody, depending on what your setup is. Um, like if you live in a van, you can be very, very flexible because you can just, you just park somewhere. Um, with 
us being in this massive fifth wheel, I do have to plan ahead and make sure I'm getting campgrounds that have everything that we need. So um, they released the schedule in November. I'll kind of sit down and like put everything into a spreadsheet so I know like just what my options are. Um, and then I'll just kind of go through and I'll pick out what tournaments I want to go to. And I try to set things up so that I never have more than four tournaments in a row. Um, so I feel like beyond that, like my quality of play kind of goes down because I'm like physically and, and mentally exhausted. Um, you know, I start to feel burnout after that. So I'll just kind of like, I could probably make it like six or seven in a row before I really got burnt out. But if I kind of preemptively say like, okay, I'm going to go four weeks on one week off, four weeks on one week off. Um, I kind of can get into a rhythm and I can kind of stay ahead of, of the burnout. Um, and I can kind of like program in that opportunity to rest. And then once I've gotten that all figured out, I'll kind of look at like, what are the days we're going to need to travel? What are the days we're going to need to check into a campground and check out of a campground? And then from there, I'll start looking for places to stay. Um, and if I can book them, go ahead and book them. Some places don't let you book that far out. So I'll, if that's the case, I'll just like, I have a big old spreadsheet with everything in it and I'll just keep like a link and then I'll set like a reminder for when I, I can go and book it. So I try to get everything booked as quickly as possible. And then I keep track of, um, you know, how much it costs to stay there. Um, I'll keep track of like how much fuel costs are and then any other like costs associated, like if I fly somewhere, um, and in SM spreadsheet kind of throughout the year, I'll fill in like how much money I made at each event. So like winnings, um, bonuses, if I do like any media coverage or if I teach any clinics or anything, I get paid for that all gets added up. And then at the end of the year, it's very easy to send off to my accountant and be like, here's what I made. Yeah. I, I definitely want to dip into the, uh, the media coverage that you're doing in clinics and stuff on tour. But first, what does that, when you do four on, one off, what is that off week typically, like what's that perfect off week for you? Yeah, so a perfect off week would be at least half of it, like not throwing. Um, and it kind of depends just on like what I feel like I need because I've had off weeks where like I'm actually good, you know, it's uh, I actually feel fine physically. And so, you know, I might, uh, continue training in the gym and I might do like a little bit of field work generally at a minimum I want to keep putting because if I take a week off from putting usually when I come back it takes at least a week to kind of get back into a rhythm and feeling really confident with it um, but like a perfect off week would be like a very tiny amount of field work just to kind of maintain some skill especially in putting and like short game and then like we're either back visiting family and friends or we're off like doing other fun non-related disc golf things like one of our off weeks um we went to yellowstone and so like in the morning i would get up and i would go putt for like half an hour throw up shots for half an hour come back pick up tyler and we go into the park and we just like do whatever we wanted to for the day um so it's kind of like all of the disc golf skills kind of go on maintenance and then it's all about just like doing stuff that's fun but not super physically taxing yeah. And do you have uh, that kind of, do you have any kind of that respite when you're in a tournament, in a season? Is there something that you do in between, like after rounds to find a little bit of rest mentally or, or physically? What's, what's going on there? Do you just go, okay, I'm done with my round. I'm going to veg and then sleep early. What's the deal? I mean, yeah, it's usually I, I come back to the trailer. I might take a nap. I'll usually watch the men play. Um, or if I just really don't feel like looking at disc golf for a bit, because maybe I, I had a bad round or I'm feeling a little bit, you know, just tired of looking at the course, I may not do that. Um, but generally just anything that's, again, not physically taxing, I'm mostly like the best way to rest and recover is to get a lot of sleep and make sure you're eating enough food. So kind of those two things. And then, you know, if there's something fun to do after, I'll go do that. Yeah. Does your diet change uh, for off season and during season at all? Um, not a ton. So this last off season, I wasn't like really trying to gain or lose weight in any way. So I kind of ate pretty much what I needed to just like stay the same weight and have enough energy to do my practice. Um, I think this coming off season, I may make an effort to gain some weight. So it'll be like the same foods, just a little bit more. Um, 
yeah, I mean, really, it's just like make sure I'm getting enough protein and then getting enough carbs and then eating vegetables every day. I'm not super strict with it. I don't really feel like there's a reason to be. Um, okay, so into the season, do you have season goals for this season? Did you have an idea before you were heading to the season? Like, here's what I want to accomplish this season. And was it uh, ratings related? Was it performance related? Was it form related? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I try to stay away from goals that can be that that rely on like what other people are doing. Um, so like with ratings, you know, I can shoot the same score and on one course one day with a stacked field, and that's going to be rated well. And if I shoot the same score like the next week with the you know different field, it's like not going to be rated that well. So it's ratings are a little bit out of my hands. So I try to kind of stay away from that. Um, I mean, there is a little bit of a ratings component with uh, staying on the elite team at Discraft. Um, But, like, if you play well and do all of the other things right, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, Now, my goals were more or less to, you know, just, like, play as well as I can, really, and to, like, continue to progress. Um, I don't, like, keep goals of, like, oh, win X number of events or have X number of top five finishes because... fact is you can play you know your best golf one weekend and someone plays one stroke better and you don't win um that doesn't mean you failed you know maybe that was your best ever and yeah so really it's just to kind of keep pushing my game forward and to just keep like learning what i need to learn in order to continue to get better um i think a lot of my struggles this year have been more on the mental side of the game and so that's kind of where a lot of my focus is at the moment um skills wise the thing i've really been hammering during season has been putting and approaching um so i feel like that's kind of a weakness in my game and then um kind of just like iterating on my process during each new swing of the tour so if i do that you know four weeks on one week off during that one week off one of the things i'll do is kind of look back on that four week period and be like okay what did i do well what did i not do well just overall in terms of my process um and see if there's anything i can try going forward into the next uh phase of the tour um so like to give you an example um last year you know i would i had one of the things i had trouble with was being really consistent with my workouts during season because you do kind of reach a point in the season where the practice rounds are really taxing and all of these other obligations start to stack up and it can be really hard to get yourself into the gym um and so one of the solutions i had was to do my Uh, Because I want to do a a lower body day, an upper body day, and then I'll do like a full body day that's a lot lighter. um, And it's more focusing on some of the little things that I don't hit on the other two days. And so it's three days a week I'm trying to get into the gym. That can be really hard when, you know, maybe you don't have, that might be three days in a row. So I started doing my lower body day like on Sunday. I would finish my round, go take a nap, and then go hit the gym. And so that leaves some flexibility to like not have to work out on Monday when I'm traveling. I can hit the upper body day on Tuesday or Wednesday. I can hit the full body day on Wednesday or Thursday. I have some flexibility there. Um, and so that's helped with consistency. And then I've had the downstream effects of like what working out consistently gets you. And so stuff like that. Um, there was after one swing of tour, I felt like I wasn't doing a good job of keeping certain skills sharp. And we kind of talked about like, would it be better to have one fewer practice day, but have a dedicated field work day. And so that's something I tried starting with um, Dynamic Discs Open, you know, for uh, DDO, Des Moines, and uh, actually all of the tournaments in that swing. I only practiced two days and then I had one day of about like four hours of field work and not four hours all in a row, like kind of split up. Um, and I've found so far that if I have a good field work day, like, and that means I'm going to be throwing the disc really well it kind of, I was kind of this frustrating point of like, well, I know the course really well, but I'm just not hitting my lines. So cool. We'll just wait till next week and try to fix it. But this is kind of being a little bit more proactive with that. Um, so yeah, really we, while we were talking about goals, <laughs> um, yeah, the goal is to really just like keep, keep executing the process every week and then iterate on it and make improvements, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> You're approaching this season, I think, a little different than most pros would go at it later in their career, like a Kristen would go at it right now, um, even though she's not like super late in her career. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you're still tweaking things form wise inside the season, right? Like for example, your putt. Yeah, it uh, what was it was Blue Ridge Championships where I felt like I was putting the way I wanted to putt, but I was splashing out left and right of the basket, and they they felt like you know I shouldn't these putts shouldn't be missing. But everyone else is making their putts. So at some point, you got to be like, okay, it might be me. Um, and so I remember that week, I mean, I, I spent probably hours at the, at the practice basket trying to figure out how to put more nose down. Um, and it's still something that I'm working on to this day is being more consistently putting, uh, no, or kind of dropping the disc into the basket instead of letting the disc kind of lift into the basket. Because uh, I think... The chains just kind of catch better if the disc is already kind of moving downward versus if the disc is moving up. If it's moving up with too much pace, it can pop out, um, pop out straight back or left or right. And obviously, spit outs haven't fully solved that problem. Um, obviously, there have been some pretty key spit outs for me this season, um, but it's definitely something that's getting better. And I think a lot of that has to do with like I've only been playing three and a half years. You know, like I've gotten very good in a short amount of time, but there's still so much. Um, to learn uh, like even just the last few weeks I feel like I've kind of figured something out both on the backhand and on the forehand side which I think is helping me hit gaps a little bit better so it's like and sometimes that's not like I don't go into the field thinking like oh I'm gonna fix this problem today I'm going into the field thinking like okay I'm gonna have to throw straight mid-range shots a lot this week so I'm gonna take all my mid-ranges and I'm gonna spend you know, half an hour, an hour, however long I think I can get quality work in, just working on that. And sometimes it'll be like, um, like last week, like I recently had a slight change into the way that I run up on my backhands and it's so slight, like I doubt anyone would even notice watching me play, but I noticed it. Um, and it's cause I went out with putters and mid ranges and I found two trees and I was like, okay, I'm going to try to hit straight shots. I'm going to try to hit and hazards. I'm going to try to hit hyzers going between these two trees. And I kind of noticed that every, all the, the angles were all right. The speed was good. The height was good, but everything was coming out right uh, of where I wanted. And so like, you know, I was like, it's perfect, except it's 20 degrees to the right. So I'm like, okay, well, what if I start my run up turned 20 degrees to the left and I plant turned 20 degrees to the left, suddenly everything's going really, really straight. And so it's, it's one of those things where almost like, I don't necessarily try to change the form, but the form just kind of, evolves on its own and you just kind of have to be open to it and roll with it yeah the um the falling into the basket versus the lifting things really interesting uh when paul and ricky were having fierce battles years ago you know paul had said it's not the it's not the circle two putts from ricky that i'm worried about or that i doubt go in he 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 was basically saying it's the 20 footers that i think he's going to miss and it's the 60 footers that I think he's going to make mm-hmm. because Ricky would have Ricky had an obscene amount of spit outs from close up because he, he drops real low and then puts up to the basket and kind of does this little boop and like pops back out. And you're like, how did that? That was center. How did that miss? Um, and so mm-hmm. but he would drain the other ones because they just drop in from ever absolutely everywhere. <laughs> but they were like literally dropping in. So, yeah, I remember just texting you like, hey you know, great third round. And you're like, yeah, I've finally got my putting fixed. And I was like, wait a second. (laughs) Round one and two, you were working on a putting change and then like, you're still working on it. And it finally clicked round three like that. People don't do that. Like that's just, usually people go into tournaments and into seasons. Yeah, I get it's like, you know, it is insane, but I think of like form changes are an investment. And so I think of it as like, okay, maybe... I'm already putting that at this tournament, um, which was the case at Blue Ridge. I think it was round one and going into round two that I I made the change and round two was kind of, and then round three was a lot better. Um, And then I went to Champions Cup the next week and I put it amazing. So like it, it, you know, it worked. Um, It was the right, it was the right move. But the way I see it with, with form changes is like, um, it's, it's an investment, right? So you're going to be a little bit worse for a duration of time, but you're going to get better if you're doing it right. Um, and so I'm like, okay, well, I would be okay with putting bad for the rest of this tournament where I'm already playing bad. If it means three tournaments from now, I'm a really confident putter. 
Um, and I think some of that is a, an understanding too of like how difficult certain things are to change. Like I wouldn't try to change too much with major with like my backhand mid season. Cause there are some, you know, the change I, I was trying to do this off season, I spent two, two and a half months on it and I got about 70% of what I wanted. It's like some things just take too long to do during season. Um, but I already have pretty good control of my putting mechanics. So it's really not that big of a change to go from a nose up spin putt to like a nose down kind of spush putt. Um, so I think it's just like, it, one, it's an investment and two, it's an understanding that this change probably isn't going to take that long, especially if I really just like hammer away at it, which is what I did and am still doing. Yeah. I, uh, I remember at Ledgestone, uh, maybe I think final round. Yeah. Sunset Hills, uh, the last round at Sunset Hills, uh, we were walking on 18 and third round. round. Okay. I, I remember asking like, oh, I remember saying something along the lines of, oh, okay, if we, you know, get a birdie here or there for the last couple holes, like, we'll be good. And uh, you had said to me on 18, you said, yeah, I don't think that I'm going to win for like two or three years, but once I start winning, I don't think I'm going to stop. And I remember there being like, whoa, that is like that's a beast right there. <laughs> that's a that's that's an athlete's coming right there. And you're still like you're to me looking in, it seems very much like you're still just throw everything at it right now and gain all the experience that you can and make all the change that you can just invest, 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 invest. Don't give uh, a rip about how the results turn out. And, you know, probably three years from now, if I do that three years in a row, then I'm going to start winning stuff. Yeah, totally. And, um, you know, there have definitely been times this year where I've kind of found myself getting caught up in the, like, I need to win right now. Um, just cause I have gotten close a couple of times. Um, so yeah, it's good that you reminded me that I said that cause I do stuff. I definitely do still believe that it's like, if you're doing all of the right things, the good results will come. And I know like I could try to just dial in and, and focus on like, okay, maximum performance this weekend. And like, maybe I'll win, but if I'm not on the flip side of that continuing to try and improve my skills like someone's gonna pass me because like you know someone's trying to get better um and like it's like i've accomplished this much in this amount of time and i know like from the little bits that i've seen here and there in tournaments and practice i know there's more and so i'm just kind of like chasing the more and I, I know like i'll win eventually it'll happen yeah it's so tough to like stay in that mindset especially you know after you've been at a form piece this is what i want our listeners to really hear she took two and a half months she had three things on her off season that she was working on and one of these two projects went down pretty quick one project took two and a half months and she only got 65 70 percent there if that's how you know she's got that engineer mind by the way because she said 65 70 percent instead of like oh i almost got there i didn't quite get there <laughs> but um it's like she got 65, 70% there. And she's like, you just can't tackle this stuff. Um, that's, I, if there's something I want them to take away from this podcast, it's just the, the patience and the trusting of the process that elevates people's games over time. If you don't quit, you're not going to lose, right? Eventually, you're going to die or it's going to get better. That's it. So, um, let's, transition a little bit into specific tournament prep we talked a little bit about how you're having a field work day in there i'd like to talk about um the structure of mm -hmm. scouting out a new tournament so what do you do before you get there are you watching like coverage from a previous year what do you do when you're in the when you're on the uh compound where you're at the course and what do you do if there are multiple courses to prepare yeah, oh, that's that's all awesome. Um, so usually the first thing I'll do is I'll look at the caddy book whenever it's released. Um, and so I'll kind of get and I and I'm, most of these courses I've I've played up until this point. Like next week we're we're playing Ledgestone. I've played that course this week. I've played this course. Um, but I'll kind of look at the caddy book if it's a course I've played. I'll look for changes, but I'll kind of get an idea 
if it's detailed enough of like what kind of shots is this course going to kind of call for um and so then monday is like travel day usually tuesdays when i get my first round in and that's a lot about just kind of an experimental practice round so i'm throwing a ton of shots i'm trying to figure out like what are all of my options on all of these different holes um what are options i think i can do a little bit more consistently and i can get about 80 to 85 percent of a game plan and then i'll kind of look at that and see okay what shots am i going to use a lot um and also what are some shots that i feel like I'm not executing the best that I could right now that are going to be relevant. And I'll use that to kind of structure what my form day, or sorry, my form, my field work day is going to be. Um, and field work day, it's usually a, like, at a top end about four hours and it's not all in a row. So what I'll do is like, say for, uh, for example, getting ready for mid America open. Um, it's a lot of wooded shots. It's a lot of straight shots. So I took uh, last week, I had a field work day and I took a, you know, mid ranges and I took putters and I took some fairway drivers. And so I was working on like flip up shots and, and kind of like having a gap far away and trying to hit this gap and just dialing that in. And I'll do that. I'll take all the discs I'm going to use to practice and I'll kind of break my field work session into like 30 minute segments. So maybe I'll work 30 minutes on hitting gaps with putters and then I'll gather up all my putters. I'll go back to my truck. I'll turn it on. I'll turn the AC on. I'll sit there and like relax for maybe 10 minutes or so. Um, and then I'll gather all of my mid ranges and I'll go do 30 minutes of trying to hit gaps with mid ranges. And then I go back to my truck. I turn on the AC. I chill for a little bit. And I kind of just do that, um, for as many drills as I need to do. Um, and then if I get to a point where I'm like, I'm just not mentally focused here anymore, I'll cut it off. Cause, uh, having, focus reps is really the key here um if i were to go just four hours in a row that first like hour is going to be really high quality but that last hour is going to be kind of lower quality and so having that little bit of rest time uh in between drills really helps me kind of mentally reset lets me sit down for a minute so you know my especially when it's this hot outside and, and that sort of thing um so that's kind of what that day will look like um putting's always a part of it i mean there's at least half an hour of putting every single day um then so that's usually wednesday and then thursday the idea is that i've got 85 percent of a game plan i just spent you know a, a long field work session dialing in the shots that i believe i need and so then thursday i'm throwing one maybe two shots per hole um, i'll throw more on that kind of like 15 percent where i'm not quite sure what i want to throw yet uh, the goal being to just feel really have a full game plan, feel really, really confident in it. And then I'll kind of finish the day. Usually I'll wait till the evening, do that half hour of putting. Um, and that cut off, I'm, I'm ready for the tournament. And then, um, obviously there's some lifting in that the way the lifting will work with the, with the whole week is I'll do kind of my hardest day, my leg day on Sunday. So I have Monday off all day to recover. I'll usually still maybe feel a little bit of soreness on Tuesday, but Tuesday I hit upper body. I'll feel a little bit of soreness from that on Wednesday. And then usually that full body workout doesn't make me sore at all. So by Friday, um, I've dialed in the shots that I need. I know the course really well. I've done my workouts and I'm fully recovered. So if I do everything right Friday, I feel amazing. And then that just kind of continues uh, through the weekend. And then we start the process over uh, Sunday night. Yeah. So, um, what I'm hearing is that before a tournament, as we get closer and closer to the first day to Friday, um, we are doing a lot, uh, I'm saying we, you are doing a lot of, a lot of repetition in the beginning, a lot of, um, testing of shots in the beginning. And then you take it all the field, you're grooving the shots that you need. You're getting really confident, getting it, um, the feel down and just making sure that you're firing kind of on all cil cylinders. And then when you do your, your practice um, back on the course after that, it's um, intentionally getting inside the rhythm that you're going to be in tournament. You're throwing one, maybe two shots off the tee. You're not trying to get in a groove there. You're trying to replicate tournament rhythm where you're not um, just fire, 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 fire. And this is something that I, um, 
here with a, or I tell a lot of students when they have an important tournament, it's like, you're going to do a lot of reps, a lot of stuff in, before um, you get to, towards the beginning of your tournament prep. It's going to be groove. You want to feel good. And then you need to disrupt your rhythm. I know a lot of pros will even like pop their phones out and uh, intentionally, you know, get on their phone and go through Instagram or play a little phone game or something like that to break up that rhythm. Cause it's easy to make uh, the 20th putt after you just miss the, you know, you miss the first five and then you find the groove, the next five, and then you're firing great, you know, 16 through 20 feel amazing. You're like, I'm the best putter in the world, but you missed the first putt and that's the one that counts. Mm -hmm. So, um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. On that note with, with putting practice, something I started doing was just resetting my feet in between each putt. Um, so I'm not necessarily going through my whole routine again, but I start, my putt starts with how I set my feet. Um, and so I've, I've found that like a lot of times, you know, maybe you miss the first putt, you make the adjustment with your upper body and then you make it, but I'm practicing getting my feet set right and kind of increasing my chances of making that first putt. I found that's been really, really helpful. Um, and then to further, you know, your kind of point on like breaking up shots, like that last practice round is usually when I like to practice with somebody else. Um, not necessarily like to be competitive, but just cause there's conversation, there's kind of stuff, you know, a, a little bit more tournament esque where you're, you're chatting in between holes, um, and that sort of thing. I'm not just throwing like shot after shot after shot. Yeah. Cause that, that'll mess with people up. They'll, they'll be playing great. And then all of a sudden during a tournament, there's a card of four, you know, and there's a backup and there's two cards on a backup on a hole. And then it's like, I'm iced. It's like, what, uh, like, what am I supposed to do? So that's, I guess, we're practicing the breaking up of the rhythm yeah. and uh, your routine. Super important. Um, and if you have those, you give yourself a really good chance of executing. But if you haven't practiced it, don't be surprised when you don't execute, right? Cool. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you have early morning rounds, like most of the people that are watching this. Um mm -hmm. Do you eat? What is your, uh, before your round, what is your routine? Oh yeah, I absolutely have to eat. Um, <laughs> I actually really like that we have morning rounds cause, um, I don't ever have a situation where I'm used to like playing first thing in the morning to like, now I'm have my whole day and then I'm playing. It's pretty much the same, no matter what time I'm playing, it's just what time do I wake up? But, um, I want to be at the course roughly an hour early that gives me time to you know figure out where i'm parking and find the warm-up area um really i only need about 40 45 minutes to warm up and so i'll kind of figure out from there like okay well how long does it take to get to the course and then one hour before that's when i wake up um so i'll wake up usually make a pot of coffee i like uh just a good old bagel with some schmear and some um greek yogurt uh, that's usually enough to mostly get me through my rounds. I'll usually need one to two snacks mid round, usually around hole six. I try to have something in the round hole 12. I try to eat something because um, I just like don't want to eat before tournament rounds. It's the only time in my life I've ever had difficulty eating. And so I found something that I can eat. That's like it tastes good. It goes down really easy and it's enough calories to like mostly get me through my round. And then I'll supplement that with some snacks later. Um, yeah, I don't know what it is about tournaments, but it's like, I'm going to have trouble eating. I have trouble eating before tournaments. Um, and then I need some kind of caffeine. That's usually coffee. Although this week with how hot it is, it might be an energy drink instead, just something like cooler. Um, and then, yeah, I get to the course. I need about 45 ish minutes to warm up. And that's usually just some like light dynamic stretches just to get my body kind of awake and, uh, get to where, you know, if anything's stiff or still sore, which usually it's not, but you know, I'm not perfect. Sometimes I'm feeling a little sore, um, get kind of moving. And then I'll start with some like power down throws. Um, I don't like to do a ton of stretching. I feel like the best way to warm up for anything is to do a like scaled back version of that thing. So I'll throw it. I'll usually find the net. I'll throw some like power down backhand, some power down forehands, and I'll gradually kind of ramp up to full power throws. Um, once that's all feeling good, I'll usually go putt for about 15, 20 minutes, like nothing crazy long, like just long enough that I'm like, okay, yeah, I can make putts. Cool. 
and then um, head over to the tee, you know, five or so minutes early, whatever they ask for. So um, a little more detail on this 45 minute breakdown. The first thing you do is stretch. And these are dynamic stretches, I'm presuming, not static stretches. Yeah. So like, you know, I'll go find a wall and I'll do like the thing where you kind of like swing your legs back and forth. Um, just because usually like my hips and my low back, especially in the morning, are the parts that are kind of stiff. Um, I might do some like, you know, like the walking quad uh, stretch or something, or uh, I'll do a little bit of like piriformis stretching where it's just like you hold it for a little bit and then you switch and then you hold it for a little bit and then you switch. Um, and I go mostly based on feel. Like if I slept funny and my back feels terrible, I'll spend a little extra time uh, kind of warming that area up. But if I feel pretty good, I'll just do the bare minimum and move on. So you got probably about five, 10 minutes of that throwing for another 20 ish and then putting for another 15, 20 ish. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Yeah. Thereabouts. And then usually I need to hit the restroom or something before I give myself a little time for that. Yeah. yeah. Not an overlooked, uh, detail for sure <laughs> um but do you have before i forget it no, anything that not. you're doing for recovery or prehab um i don't do a lot beyond making sure i get enough sleep um i think that's like number one thing for recovery uh so generally i try to give myself enough time to get nine hours of sleep i usually don't need that much occasionally i need more than that um so that really starts you know the night before make sure I'm going to get nine hours of sleep. So if I need to be up at seven, you know, whatever time that is 10, uh, that's bedtime. And then uh, after the rounds, you know, usually Seth's got those like leg compression things. I don't know how good those actually are. They feel nice after. So I usually hit those if that's available. Um, and then really it's just like chilling. If something's feeling stiff or sore, I might give it like a little bit of a dynamic stretch later, but yeah, I really don't do much beyond, uh, sleep and eat enough. All right. So in, during the round now, what are the things that you're thinking about cues, um, routines, like what, what are the predominant few things that you're thinking about during the round? Or is it a lot? Maybe it's not even a few, maybe it's a million. <laughs> I mean, I wish I was really consistent with where my headspace is in rounds, but it's probably the biggest struggle that I have. Um, really, the problem that I have and that I try to avoid is I, you know, during that first round, if I start off rough or slow, it could be really hard to dig myself out of it because I could kind of feel like the tournament slipping away so early. And then usually I'll come back in round two and three, think I'm out of it be like, oh, whatever, let's just play golf, play great, get back into the top five and then move on, you know, next week. Um, but like the tournaments where I play really well, I'm like not really thinking. I usually have like a song in my head or something and I'm feeling just like very chill. Um, I'm usually like chatting with people in the car or chatting with my caddy. Um, and then when I, you know, get up to throw, I try not to have a lot of cues. Um, sometimes you need it. Like sometimes uh, I'll kind of find I go back and forth between like throwing it like you mean it and like just staying smooth. So sometimes I'll start out like a little tentative. Uh, maybe I'm kind of early releasing or I'm not getting as much kind of pop on the disc. Uh, and so I'll kind of tell myself to be a little more aggressive, be a little bit more of like an attacking kind of mindset. Um, but if I'm, you know, the opposite and I'm kind of trying, I feel like I'm trying a little too hard. I'm kind of pulling discs. I'll tell myself to just kind of like, chill out and be smooth um and kind of let the disc do the work trust like all those kind of cues so it's usually some balance between like needing to attack more and needing to be a little bit more uh smooth and then on the putting green i really just try to like i have my target i like stare at it and uh you know if i'm, I'm usually f feeling some kind of nerves especially if it's like an early round putt or maybe it's a putt in that range that's like you really should make this but you might not um I'll kind of just tell myself, like, you know, go robot mode, just be robotic about it. And so I'll just stare my target down, like if looks could kill, kind of stare at it and then just like down slow, make sure I'm using my back leg uh, to create the pop. And it usually just goes in if I do that. And then I don't really worry about it. <laughs> yeah. So you got a handful of cues. You're 
trying to figure out kind of what cues it seems like work for you. You're still in this testing process. Everybody has this. Um, I tell a lot of newer players at tournaments, they're like, oh, you know, what's going to happen? I don't know what to expect. And it's like, well, you know, you're going to meet uh, tournament. Tournament, you use a whole different person. You haven't met them yet. Uh, you don't know tournament Josh. He doesn't. Mm -hmm. it, you will meet mm -hmm. him at the tournament and then every time you're in these pressure situations tournament josh shows up mm -hmm. and you got to start having conversations with him like bro you're just you know you're shanking everything right what's up with that why are you doing that and then you eventually find out why through reflection of the round afterwards or maybe you know if you're fortunate enough it happens during rounds sometimes and eventually you have the conversation enough with the tournament you mm -hmm. to find out what when stuff's going wrong, like what tournament you thinking or focusing on? So it seems like for you, tournament Holland tends to uh, not commit is one of the things. So you know, throw it like you mean it. That's like a very powerful and important cue for you. And so for the people listening, you've got to figure out, you've got to do this post op, this reflection after the throw, and say, you know, why do I keep having this pattern of miss? Because what you're describing are patterns. Right. It's not like you're doing, mm -hmm. you know, seven different types of misses. They're usually the same type of miss. And you just got to figure out why you're missing that way, what the mental mm -hmm. cue is to make you stop missing that way. And then tell yourself before you throw it. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, I, I see that in, in putting with myself a lot. Like if I'm pulling it right, usually I'm not using my legs and I'm overcompensating with my upper body and that causes me to pull it right. Um, same thing if I'm missing low, I'm usually not using my lower body. Um, or sometimes like, you know, just check what my starting wrist position is. Um, cause sometimes that has, you know, an impact on how much pop I can actually get on the disc. And so things like, uh, slow down or, you know, aim high, you know, trust like those kind of cues, um, can help with that. And then there are some times where like with certain upshots, like if I'm in an awkward stance, like maybe I'm doing a a, a sidearm but i'm having to step out to the left so instead of kind of turning my hips i'm having to do it more open and so i'll kind of emphasize that the hips aren't going to come through naturally so i'll kind of you know i'll maybe do a few little like hip turn motions before i throw just to kind of like remind myself that you have to force the hips to go in this position they're not going to go on their own just kind of little things that you pick up if you just pay attention um, cause I think the temptation when you make a mistake or when you're in a situation you haven't been in before the temp and it doesn't go well, the temptation is to just be upset and it's okay to be upset. I definitely get upset sometimes, but then you have to go back and look on it and be like, okay, like really, why did this happen? What can I try next time? And you do have to view it, especially when you're relatively new at tournaments, you have to view it as like, you're trying things. Like you're never going to be perfect right off the bat. You can do this for years and still never be perfect. Even Chris, it's not perfect. You know, everybody, everybody's just learning all the time. And you have to kind of like give yourself that space. For sure. Yeah, it's really important after a mistake to not just go, oh, dude, idiot. Right. You, you can have an emotional response where emotional people and some mm -hmm. people need an emotional response to keep their emotions from super high, super low. Right. So sometimes like, dude, what are you doing? Um, like help someone bring the emotion down and just kind of just clear the air. But then after that, you need a corrective phrase. You need something like it comes out early, like, oh, come on, Holland. Mm -hmm. Like throw it like you mean it, right? That makes it to where that's the difference between uh, how consistent pros are over amateurs is amateurs, we take you know, a whole round and it's not until the car ride afterwards where we're like, what? why do I keep missing left? And you're thinking and thinking and it's annoying you and annoying you. And then you're finally like, I just didn't commit enough. Um, and then next time, hopefully it starts happening again and you're nine holes in. And you're like, wait a second, we've been here before. <laughs> we're missing left because we're not committing. Throw it like you mean it. Um, and then pros have learned to compress that. Paul, mm -hmm. he doesn't make the same miss twice. He might miss high one time, but the next time it's mm -hmm. not going to be high. It might be low, might be right, might be left, but it's not going to be high. He's going to correct that miss right there and give himself a better better chance of making the next one, right? And that's all it's about is give yourself good chances. So Tyler, yo, Bo, is 
your full-time caddy. What does he do for you as a caddy? Is he giving you shot selection stuff? Is he just kind of hanging back off of that and playing a supportive role? Uh, yeah, so kind of a mix. I mean, usually if I want, like I'm pretty open about like if I'm not 100% on a shot, so I might be like, hey, I'm thinking this. And so usually he's just like, okay, yeah, that's probably good because like if it's what I'm thinking, it's probably right just because that's my first instinct for a reason. Uh, but then there have definitely been times where he's just like, no, that's dumb. You should do this. Um, or like, you know, if we walk up to a shot and he feels like he really has something to say about it, um, he'll interject. But he's pretty mindful about when he chooses to do that for the most part. Um, I think it's best to just kind of let me throw the way that I think I need to throw. But then every now and again, I'll have an idea that's just not a good idea. Um, and then there have been times, too, where like you know, I know a decision is probably not the optimal decision normally, but given the scenario, uh, it's actually a better decision. Like I'll give an example. So at Kansas City wide open, hole 18 in practice, I knew if I was very aggressive off the tee, there was a chance I could get up and down for a look at an eagle. Um, and I hadn't actually pulled it off in practice. I kept being just a couple feet short of the second landing zone when I would try to go across in the second shot. Um, but we both knew that this was in theory possible. Well, lo and behold, we're on the final round. Um, I'm one stroke back of Allie. There's no reason to expect that she's not going to birdie. Um, this is her home course and she's done it the other two rounds. And so I, I know like in round two, if I say I want to go for Eagle, he's going to be like, no, that's dumb play for birdie. Um, and birdie play was just a nice hyzer over some trees, a little chip up to the second landing zone and then a chip up from there. If I want to go for the Eagle, I have to take my nuke. I have to hit a gap with like a hill and kind of get a little lucky through some trees to get to a spot where I have footing to then throw another nuke shot. And it turned to him and I'm like, I think I have to go for the Eagle. And he's just like, yep. And so like having kind of that, I don't know, that validation of like, this is a bad idea, but I think we have to do it. And him being like, no, no, it's a good idea actually. Um, and you know, I ended up not executing the shot very well, got up and down for a birdie look and missed the putt. Cause I knew I lost at that point. So whatever. But, um, kind of stuff like that of usually it's making sure that i'm making the smart choice and not doing something needlessly aggressive um because i think that's a trap i could fall into especially like knowing how far i can throw a disc it can be really tempting on a course maybe like ddo or vegas to just check the disc as far as i can even though that's not really the smartest play so yeah i guess his role in that is just like you know validating when I'm questioning something or helping me answer a question or just like making sure I'm not doing anything like excessively stupid. Yeah. How often are you deviating? So you said uh, you get about 85% of your game plan figured out in this early um, stages of tournament prep. How often are you deviating from your plan, either in like changing the shot shape completely instead of going turnover backhand, you're like, okay, I'm just going to throw a forehand here today and or how much do you change the disc? Or are you like, I'm always trying to stick. And I'm talking about most cases, not a, I'm walking up on 18. Allie's got a stroke on me. I need to go for Eagle, but just like, okay, um, I'm in round one. I'm on hole, you know, 16. And this is what my game plan was. It was to throw this disc on this shot. How often do you change either of those things? And what does it take for you to change something? Yeah, it's hard to say how often. I feel like it's not that frequently. It might be a handful of shots per round, and that kind of depends on the nature of the course. Because like, if we're playing in the woods and like I'm out of position, obviously I'm deviating from the game plan. Um, usually, it's because I like for whatever reason I'm not feeling confident in a shot, and I'm throwing a different kind of shot really, really well that day. Um, but probably the most common uh, thing is just like wind. Um, so I, I give an example, if I've got generally when I'm throwing an approach shot, like a little touch approach shot, I want it and I'm out in the open where it might be windy. I prefer to throw either a backhand hyzer or a forehand hyzer. Um, and then if there's like a crosswind, I want to throw it with the top of the disc into the wind. Cause I want to be able to give it more power and let the wind kind of kill it most of the time. Um, rather than try to be like touchy with it and have the wind kind of like pick it up and take it who knows where. 
Um, so maybe in practice, I was throwing a forehand approach the entire time and like that's the game plan. But if the wind's going the other way, I might switch it. Um, same thing like off the tee, you know, if I like uh, what Beaver State fling, I think hold 12, one of the really big downhill shots. You know, I had been going passion every single day in practice just because I liked a late flip up. I felt like the miss was on the right side of the fairway and that was the better miss. But then we got up there in the tournament and it was a bit of a headwind. And I was almost thinking like, yeah, you know, maybe I stay with the passion. Um, we disc up actually to my UV vulture per like Tyler's recommendation. He was like, no, it's a headwind. Just throw your UV vulture the same way you throw the passion in practice. It'll be perfect. I parked it. It was fine. Um, so there's another example of like wind um, being, it's, it's usually wind. Occasionally it'll be like, I feel like I'm throwing putters really bad. So maybe I'll just disc up to a mid range because I feel a little bit more confident. If I go long, I go long. Um, sometimes like, you know, if I have a blister on my hand and it's making my forehands come out weird, I may try to throw more turnovers, but usually it's wind. Yeah. sounds like you're basically always trying to throw the high percentage shot. And if it's, uh, if the wind pulls that percentage down, like if you got a headwind and you were throwing a turnover, well, I'm throwing a forehand now because I could throw some overstable on a forehand hyzer and it's going to cut through and be all right. Or I'd, you're saying you'd rather the the wind push the disc down because at least you can control more where it lands versus the wind lifting it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, mo most of the time that's what I want. I mean, sometimes you know you get a nice cross. You know, if I would normally just chip a forehand and it's a really far hole, it's like you know really far into the right. But today I have a left right wind. I might think like, oh, awesome! I can actually get a little bit more aggressive because the wind's going to help me. So there are some times where. I'll kind of break that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's like you said, if I think the higher percentage shot is actually something different from what I practiced and I feel like it's something I can execute, even if it's not something I particularly practiced in this situation, I think it's really important to not be afraid to go to that. Um, because I've practiced all of these shots. Like just cause I didn't do it this one time, this one week doesn't mean I don't know how to do it. I'm not capable of executing it. Um, yeah, you said it just a lot more concisely than I did. <laughs> right. No, no, it's all right. You have, uh, yeah, you've got every, you've got all your stock hyzers and your overstable shots and, uh, you don't deviate, uh, much, but it sounds like you're, you're cognizant of not just what the higher percentage shot is because of wind conditions, which is usually the one thing that does change. Um, but also personal percentage that day. It's like, man, I'm just in big germ I, has talked about this. Like he'll throw all yeah. backhands on a course one day and like he'll just mix it up. And if the forehand's just popping, he'll throw a hyzer flip to Anheuser forehand instead of a backhand because it just felt better that day. Um, and that's the nice thing about having, you know, both sides of the game, which is happening a lot more with players nowadays that they're able to throw on both wings. I think this year we're seeing way more forehands out of the FPO field than before. Yeah, I've actually like, I feel like some people are, they're taking a very similar method that I did to, to, to learn my forehand, which was just to like, you know, get the release right and then kind of grow the distance from there by like gradually expanding your reach back. And I, I recognize my method happening a lot all over the place. And I'm kind of like, uh oh my gosh. <laughs> the Instagram followers weren't worth it. <laughs> no, they were, they were definitely worth it. <laughs> um, so you're commentating. Mm -hmm. You're commentate. You're doing some commentating here and there, right? With, um, with, um, remind me, it, is uh, it Central Coast? No, it, no, don't remind me. It was Central Coast. Yes. So you were doing, um, commentating for Central Coast. I'm not sure how much you've done so far this season with them, but did that like mess anything up for you? Seeing yourself, like, are you watching footage throughout the season? Was this something that's like, okay, not a big deal because I'm already watching footage? Or is it like, okay, like now I'm going to see myself and potentially look and see form issues? Yeah, from form issues, not really. Um, honestly, the biggest form issue that I was like trying to tackle in the off season. Like I don't really see it unless I slow myself down. So just watching myself play, uh, play back on coverage, um, doesn't really get it in my head. The only thing I don't love sometimes about doing coverage is when I have to go commentate 
on a round I played in and I know I played bad <laughs> or I know I was like not reacting very well to my shots and I'm not really looking forward to going back and watching it. Um, I don't watch a ton of FPO coverage during season and that's not to like avoid anything in particular. It's just by the time I've played, you know, three practice rounds and three tournament rounds and probably watched a good bit of the men's coverage, you know, after uh, live, it's just like, I'm kind of sick of looking at that course and I kind of want to just like move on and, and, and start focusing on the next one. Um, but sometimes I will go back in the off season and watch, especially if I'm like, you know, kind of missing being out there. It'll kind of give me a little bit of that. Um, yeah, it's not that weird, like commentating. Um, like I'm more focused on like kind of explaining the course and like the shot selections and like why certain players might choose certain things. Um, I guess it's like almost like putting on a different hat and because I'm so focused on like, what I'm saying and stuff. I'm not necessarily focused on like analyzing things. It's kind of hard to do both. Yeah. Were you uh, like nervous when you started commentating? Because I would love to do commentary, but it's kind of like when, uh, like I know I would be, I, I imagine I would not be very good in the beginning, just like I love caddying, <laughs> but I feel like I did an awful job caddying with you. I was, I'm like, man, I said way more. I need to say just, wouldn't shut up and i feel like i'm gonna do the same thing commentary if i ever get the chance but it's fun to try but also it's like yeah you know it's kind of an important job yeah maybe a little bit um because when you're actually doing commentary like it's me and nate perkins sitting in front of a laptop talking about what we see on the screen it's not like i'm in front of it's not like public speaking right it it's not you don't really feel the audience there when you're doing it um, there are a couple of things that are a little bit weird, like getting the the timing right of things. Like if you're doing a hole preview, you don't know how long this drone's going to take to fly the hole. So it could feel a little awkward if you get like ahead of the drone. Um, or if you see like the drone going to the MPO basket instead of to the FPO basket being like, oh, wait, no, that's the FPO basket, you know, stuff like that. And then, yeah, like you said, it can feel like, awkward to not talk at times but as a viewer it's actually nice when they're not just filling space with words like if people are just tapping out you don't necessarily need to be like and Kristen's tapping out her part and Katrina's tapping out her part and you don't need to comment on that you can just like sit there and let the ambient sounds of disc golf kind of be the focus but it can feel awkward just be sitting there with a the microphone and like not saying anything yeah do you have any uh like embarrassing stories? Uh revolving commentary. Yeah. Sorry. Not really. I mean I I guess sometimes you know you like mess up the intro and have to do it again. Um oh there was when when uh, Allie and I were I don't know if this is embarrassing but it's funny. Uh when Allie and I were doing one of the rounds of Kansas City um we were starting hole 2. And so Allie was supposed to do, I was letting Allie do the whole breakdowns because it's her home course and she knows it pretty well. I think this was the first round she'd ever done commentary and we're getting to hole two and the drone flyover for hole three starts playing. It, like they just put the wrong clip in there. And so she kind of like is, is panicking for a second. So I was just like describing hole two, even though it's not at all what we were looking at. So I wonder if, uh, I think that might've been round one of Kansas City. So I wonder yeah. if you can like, hear that i didn't go back and watch it so i don't know how much they like edited it <laughs> but um they're all that is a big part of it is like when you're watching trying to notice like when did they mess up a graphic or when did they get a wrong clip or miss a clip and then tell them after yeah yeah it's always interesting when you're in it like the stuff that you see you're like man oh man everybody's gonna notice that and then they don't and you're like how, how did nobody notice that it was like the biggest goof up ever but yeah yeah um, okay, so I think on, I think, I, th I don't think anybody who wanted to know anything about tournament prep is going to be disappointed with the information we covered. I don't think we left anything out. That's all my questions anyway. So, um, we're going to head into the Patreon only segment where our patrons get to ask questions that I'm going to. Ask Holland. So if you're not a patron, consider joining our Patreon. You get a 20% discount to our store, as well as all these 
bonus questions and there's going to be a lot usually they're form stuff uh but i told everybody the topic here today so i think most of them are asking questions about yeah prep so cool cool thanks for thanks for watching and we'll catch you next time